If ever a man had the reputation of being a legend in his own lifetime, surely this was the man. He was born in Scotland, in the Western Isles, about the year 1612. He was the younger son of Colchish, a name abbreviated into Colchito in the Lowlands, and sometimes incorrectly applied to his son Alistair. Col Colchish is said to have married an O'Can, while tradition gives her the name of MacDonald at MacDale. He, he may have been married twice, but if so, there is nothing to show which of the two wives was Alistair's mother. The father had long struggled against Argyle and the Campbells in the Western Isles, and was at last driven out in 1639. He migrated to the, the coast of Antrim, where other branches of the MacDonalds had long been settled, and where they were generally known as MacDonalds, a variation used beyond by some uh, bra branch of the clan remaining in Scotland. Colchish was accompanied uh, or followed by his son Alistair, a youth of gigantic fame and strength. He joined the Irish in the wars of 1641 and commanded with them in several battles. He is about to receive a wound in one of these engagements, as that was held of him until 1644, when his cousin, uh, the Earl of Antrim, placed him in command of a, an expedition intended for the support of the Royalist cause in Scotland, consisted of six, 1,600 men. He sailed from passage near Waterford in three ships and a pinnace on the 27th day of 1644. After five days, uh, he landed in the Sound of Islay. We are to understand that on his arrival, uh, should he should receive support from the sea forts and the Campbell's clans. But to his dismay, he found that where these were not actually opposed to him, they were merely passive lookers on. Seeing the unfavorable conditions of the country, he uh, resolved to re return. After five days, he landed in the Sound of Islay. He was led to understand that on his arrival, he should receive support from the sea fort and the other clans. But to his dismay, he found that where these were not actually opposed to him, they were merely passive onlookers. Seeing an unfavorable condition of the country, he resolved to return. But Argyle had in the meantime burned his vessels. Left without a means of return, MacDonald found himself in a desperate plight. Equal to the occasion, he seized two castles, Mingari, Lachlan, so as to secure a place of refuge when pressed. In the meantime, Montrose sent word to meet him at Atoll, united with the Royalist leader in the north. They won a decisive victory over the parliamentary forces at the famous Battle of Tippermoor. This was the first of the series of notable engagements in which he took part. They included Inverlochy, Aldron, etc. He was very strong and active in person and was always ready to show example in the extremity of danger. The feats of strength and courage shown by uh, this champion seem to have made a stronger impression on the minds of the Highlanders than the great military skill of the Marquis of Montrose. Numerous traditions are still preserved in the Highlands concerning MacDonald. He was knighted by his general after the Battle of Kilsyde. 
the 15th of August 1645, as the complete route of the enemy was due to his charge. He was a Herculean physique, for here is one recorded account. At the Battle of Alderhin, Alistair was in good position on high and comparatively dry ground, with stone walls of uh, killyards to serve for entrenchments. He needed every bit of his advantage, for he had only 500 men. Horry's infantry that now marched across the stream to attack were 3,000 strong and supported by a thousand horse. But a worse danger than these awaited Alistair, and that was that his regiment, who led the forces across the bog, was that of the Campbells of Lowers, one of the two finest regiments in Scotland. And as these Campbells splashed and squalored their way through the marsh on the dark and drizzly morning, announcing their accustomed intelligence that the Campbells were coming, they looked up at their ancient enemies, the Macdonalds, snugly entrenched behind garden and farmyard walls, and shouted insults at those dirty cowards who could not face a foe in the open, but waited in the pigsties until they were rooted out. It was too much for Alistair. What is it the Campbells are calling us? he said softly to Ronald Oog MacDonald of Mull. Pigs, Your Honour, was the equally soft answer. This is very bad manners, said Alistair. Had best give them a lesson. Without waiting to give any signal to his men, he dashed out of the enclosure and down upon the enemy in the bad, boggy ground. No signal was needed but the sight of the redhead leaping like a flame through the murky air and the call of his battle cry. With an answering yell, the MacDonalds came scrambling and hurling over the walls of the yards and the archers to follow their chief. They too had heard the insults and their ancestral foes and were burning to get grips with them. But the sheer weight of numbers slowly pressed them back and soon there was the danger of being outflanked and totally surrounded. Step by step, uh, disputing every inch of the knee, they were forced back to the position they had been so mad to forego. But now Alistair made up of that folly to the best of his power, which became more than human. He had been forced to charge down he was last to go back guarding his men's approach to the farmyards with the mighty sweeps of his sword. The pikemen were upon him, but he caught their long spikes on the wooden target. An ordinary man would be borne to the earth by them, but round went Alistair's sword again, cutting them through on one stroke, leaving his shield bristling with their heads. Now he himself, with his brother-in-law, Davidson of Arkna Cross, and Ranald Oak MacDonald, had reached the archway in through the farmyard wall. They wished him to go in first, but he would not till they were safely through. They were struggling with a thick surrounding group of men, who swayed back as Alistair struck, and struck again, then stopped short, for that huge sword that scarcely a man but himself could lift, and snapped in his hand. Davidson of Ardna Cross handed him his own sword, and in that same unguarded instant was struck to his death. In the confusion, the enemy had got in through the archway, and Alistair dashed to clear it to them. Ranald, just outside, was keeping a dozen pikemen at bay. He turned to face the enemy. This sword was at his breast, his shield on his left hand, and a handgun in his right hand. So said one who saw him, and the pikemen who were after him halted. But at that moment some bowmen, running past, shot their arrows at him, and one went a fist linked to both his cheeks. He threw away his gun and laid hold of his sword, 
talked at it, but it would not come. He tried again, and the hilt twisted round his hand. He had to lower his shield hand to take hold of the sheet, and this time drew it. But in that instant, he had to drop his left arm with the target on it. He received five pike wounds in his unguarded breast. Yet he reached the gate of the yard and was backing through it. But as he did so, one of the enemy following closely to get in first and cut off his retreat, ducked his head under the arch of, in the wall. Alistair cut it off with one sweep of Davidson's claymore and it bounced again against Reynolds' shanks while the body fell in the gateway. Reynold picked up the head and looked behind him at the door. It was then he saw his companion. Alistair pulled him back through the doorway, cut off the head of the arrow and struck through Reynolds' two cheeks and drew it out. But many stragglers had not won back and again and again Alistair rushed out to the enclosure to attack the foes that beset them and help them enter. That was the Battle of the Giants in Asaga, but only in Asaga that can even giants fight with the odds eight to one against them and win. Seamus Graham of Montrose and his major, General Alistair Colquita, walked slowly down in front of our line and talked to each other. Lame Sir Willem Rollo, that fateful man hobbled along behind them. Montrose looked a small man beside Alistair MacDonald of Danvig, son of Colquita of Collinsey. But most men would look small by the side of the giant. He turned his back to us, did Alistair, set his legs wide in the heather, his claymore point off the ground in his right hand. He was not left-handed, despite his nickname of Colquito, and thrust his dark red head forward towards the line of the enemy, advancing down onto the slow, so sure. He was wearing the red and green bart filibeg of Clan Renland, and his legs were like towers. Never any more were their legs like Alistair's. So mighty, so shapely, so springly. Though he had great shoulders and great arms, the terrific drive of his swording, so it was said, came out of his legs. And no quarter by Morris Moore that was from that book. MacDonald, hearing of the cruelty committed by the Ar Argyle on his uh, friends and clansmen, parted with Monroe's on the 2nd of September 1646. After being entreated by Montrose to remain, he replied he would be no true Highlander if he preferred even the king's cause to that of his own blood and kindred. When he reached the west, the sons of the friends who were scattered through Scotland and with their combined forces attacked Macdonald Cantar in May 1647. Their artillery uh, played heavily on MacDonald's ranks, and time after time drove him back until the most of the little army was destroyed. After the engagement, which lasted a whole day, he retreated to Islay, leaving a garrison at Dunoverty in the coast of Cantire, which Leslie besieged and butchered to a man more than 50 years ago, writes John MacDonald. MD. I saw the bones of some of these noble fellows bleached white in the sands of the sea beach below and a highland on which the old castle stood, and thus perished by a dastardly and inhuman massacre the last day of Sir Alistair MacCullough's heroic Irishman, the Montrose Irish Brigade, in less than two years after leaving their native shore. MacDonald, accompanied by a few friends, departed from Islay, whither he had fled and escaped to Antrim. Here he recruited his troops and soon afterwards obtained a command from the Council of Kilkenny as Lieutenant General of Munster. 
He commanded the Battle of Dangan's Hill and was governor of Tranmill, where Inchiquin would fire and sword when true Munster, but avoided coming to an engagement with him. So we come to Nocknanos and his final battle on the 12th of November 1647. Lord Taff with MacDonald, second in command, marched from Kenturk with 7,464 foot and 1,076 horse to Nocknanos, about four miles east of Kenturk. Likewise, O'Brien marched from Mallow to a place called Gary Duff. He had 4,000 foot and 1,200 horse. On the morning of the following day, the 13th of November, Inchiquin marched westward and drew up his battle lines facing Taff at Nocknanos. The following account is taken from the Cork Historical and Archaeological Journal. The word given on our side was victory, the mark a branch of a new broom in our hats. The enemy's mark was a strewn rope about their hats and their word was God and St. Patrick. The enemies, or Lord Taff, raged their battle in a plain front all along the hill, and so they might engage all their force together. Their foot were drawn into nine divisions, of which the greater part by much was pike, whinged and three bodies of horse on each side beside reserves. Our foot, whose number was by half the lesser, were marshalled into three divisions, whereof two parts of three were muskets. The right and left wing of horse were made up of 13 bodies of horse, seven on the right wing and six on the left, with their reserves. Both armies thus drawn up Taff made a major tactical blunder in that he made the cavalry charge in front of his foot. O'Brien's musketeers put up such withering fire of shot that the left wing turned round and charged back to their own foot, causing utter confusion and therefore the left wing ran clean away. In the meantime, on the right wing, MacDonald charged down with his 3,000 red shanks sweeping all before them and took two field pieces. Turning them round and firing at the enemies caused dreadful havoc. They chased the left wing of Inchiquin's army a considerable distance through the country. In the meantime, Inchiquin was able to draw most of his horses from the right wing and with these heavy reinforcements counter-attacked and cut MacDonald's regiments to pieces. He was left with no cavalry to uh, cover his foot and so the battle was lost. The number slain would be approximately 1,000 of Inchiquins and possibly 2,000 of Taft's which were mostly made up of MacDonald's troops. As his were the only regiment and stood their ground and fought bravely how he met his own death is not quite clear. Various accounts are given as to the manner in which MacDonald met his death. Seeing the mortality of his men and his own present danger, he yielded upon a quarter of life and arms. But alas, now in restraint, his quarter signed by unnatural and tyrannic Inchiquin, riding behind a horseman, won boredom, a captain of horse coming to him with a naked sword did trust him through country to all the laws of both arms and nations. The very impartial history of war of Ireland written by a British officer in Sir John Clashworth's regiment contained the following account. And Macdonald himself going off two or three miles got quarters and all those men who struck to him from a cornet of horse called O'Grady at which times come up one major pardon afterwards a uh, baronet and demanded of the coronet who it was he gave quarters to on which he told him on which pardon was in a fury 
and shot MacDonald in the head, being the other prisoner, and so MacDonald was lost. In revenge of which the coronet for seven years fought for them every year, but most commonly got the worst, which was the more pity. Cart quotes Renuccini's version of the occurrence, which reads to the effect that after rooting in Quinn's left wing, he sent notice of the fact to his own left wing, but his messenger not returning, he moved to an eminence a little distance from his men to observe what was being done in the field, and on his return was intercepted by a party of 14 horses who refused to quarter. He killed four of them, and while parallying with their captain was treacherously stabbed from behind by a soldier, and at once fell dead. Local tradition, which is very strong on the subject, agrees in that the main with the latter version. It has it that he was returning to the battlefield after having pursued his opponents a considerable distance. He expected to see the left wing of his own army in possession of the field, but was disappointed to behold the country. He was then seized and led off a prisoner under a guard of five horsemen. In crossing the little stream which runs to the west of the site of the battle at the place called the Chieftain's Ford, his horse stopped to drink. MacDonald leaned forward on the saddle to relieve his horse of as uh, much weight as possible, and in doing so, disclosed an opening in the armour underneath the corset. One of the guard, espying the unprotected part, drove his sword through his back. Thus perished by the blood hand of an assassin, one of the greatest and bravest warriors of his time. The assassin, whose name was Samuels, is said to have been the owner of a small landed property near Charleville, which has long since passed away from his name and family. Tradition has it Alistair was buried for three days under a large tree at the corner of Ramahar Kitchen Garden and then belonged to a Mr. Purcell. His body was taken by the O'Callaghan's of Clanmean and buried in a special tomb under the northeastern corner of the old church. The present writer, together with some friends, went into his tomb about five years ago. Inside, in the lead lining of the coffin, and from its appearance, must indeed be one containing his remains. Kalkita was unwilling uh, to have the, the fight uh, performed on that day upon a superstitious observation, for that he was exceedingly afraid of Saturn's malevolent influence, that day being to him critical. His sword was a very remarkable one and had a very business-like appearance. A ball of 10 pounds weight ran along from the hilt to the point in an indented groove, so that when he raised his hand, the ball glided to the hilt, and when he made a stroke, it rushed to the point, causing the weapon to strike with an irresistible force. It was preserved for a long time by the Egmont family at Lower Castle. Okay. He, he didn't go hide either. My God, we no come to think of it. All we heard about all the great men that died for Ireland and died here and then. But MacDonald, he always was in front. He always led his men. That was a, big, a, a very big item. He deserve a big round of applause. Come on. And for his daughter who read so well. So Dennis, Dennis is the author of uh, The Battle of Knocked on Us. Uh, is there somebody else? I'd just like to thank everybody for actually putting this presentation on. It's a privilege and an honour to come here from Scotland to commemorate any hero, in fact, go anywhere in the world. But for the Irish to consider Alistair a hero, we're very privileged, like I said, to come across here. And thank you very much for putting on an event and looking after the grave and making him recognised as he has been. Because without yourselves, he'd be forgotten about. 
simple as that, be forgotten. Thank you. I won't detain, de detain you too long, but just <clears throat> I'd like to thank all the organising committee for organising this, for Dennis and Jeff and for Ben here, here and for the men here on my left, of course, that have done the history of today. To his daughter there for reading uh, such very difficult language, but read it very well indeed. Thank you very much. And we in Kilburn uh, are absolutely delighted to be associated with uh, Alistair MacDonald and uh, all belonged in the history, all belonged to him. We had a history week uh, last weekend and his name came up in a little bit of history in Kilburn. It was for the Bealtonist Festival and uh, he was mentioned, so his name will continue on and on and on. So our Scottish friends, we're absolutely delighted to be associated with you and someday hopefully we'll make it to your part of the world and uh, have a little bit of a weekend there. But thank you again for coming and thanks for the interest that you have here in our little bit of uh, uh, historic uh, evening here this evening. Our cameramen and all the rest of their professionals at this stage. Dennis, no doubt you have a few words to say, so you'll come and follow, follow on. Thank you very much indeed. Many people wonder how Alistair McCullough uh, became such a great favourite with the people of this area and for so long. It doesn't really matter now what happened at Nocturnus or what the real story was of the players and movers involved in it. Time has moved on. We have learned to learn from the past and to move on. What we know about Alistair McCullough comes mainly from Scottish and Irish folklore. It is colourful, fanciful, partisan and often invented or distorted. Many portraits of Alistair McCullough emerge. We may speculate which is the true one. For his supporters, he was Goshkok Nagail, the renowned commander of Red Shank regiments that he led to victory after victory against Clan Campbell and the Covenanters. In the process, he proved himself the greatest swordsman ever produced in all the Gaelic race. For his critics, he was on Krakatoor, the devastator who devastated Clan Campbell, killed without mercy and without regard for the Geneva Convention or the United Nations Charter on Human Rights. For the people of the south of Ireland, particularly the people around here, he was McAllistrum, a hero, an inspiration and a consolation for nine generations through 250 years of national degradation and religious suppression. He came among them a famous Gaelic warrior and commander, and he was on their side. They had witnessed the intense drama of Nocturnus, the funeral here at Clonmean, and they had his grave. A huge, powerful man, princely, fearless, ferocious and eventual. He was their ideal warrior, and his explosive zest sat well with their own national fiery spirit and their fatalistic outlook. An outlook neatly articulated by Alistair's great friend and fellow battler, James Graham, 1st Duke of Montrose. He either fears his fate too much, or his deserts are small, who puts it not unto the touch to win or lose it all. The story of Alistair was heard everywhere and celebrated everywhere. It was passed down in the fixed format of McAllistrum's march 
through the nine generations until the early years of the 1900s when more modern native lights of freedom had arisen to eclipse it. In two generations, Alistair and his music were lost and forgotten. But not quite. It is to keep faith with those generations of spirited men and women that we, the first freeborn generation of their inheritors, have put up a stone to Alistair McCullough. It is, too, a monument to the endurance and eternal hope of our people. Er yeshte garevanam galea. Thank you. Monument to the greatest soldier of his time. There will never again be a Macdonald in any shape or form because he certainly, he certainly was the man. Now, I could be talking forever, but uh, my, my English isn't very good and I, 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 I might say the wrong things at the wrong time. I, I, they might send me to the Olympics, but I'd say hardly to compete. <laughs> In the great honour, they have a memorial to that famous man. Um, because it knocked on us. Uh, he, 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 he was in charge of the right hand side. And you may be sure <laughs> that all the boys in, uh, opposing him, they had to get out the way quick. Whereas the fellow on the left hand side, he was a lord, lord tough, and he knew as much about soldiering as a donkey. And uh, actually, he made a mess of the way he placed his troops. First of all, he uh, got his, hat, his horse to charge uh, O'Brien's foot at, in the trench. And they put up such a withering fire that the, his, horse, his horse was swung around and made, say, shot, shot into his own foot and shattered them all over the place. 
So uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think that he'd, he'd work with the Romans. <laughs>